Alexander Bernard. I think we are live looking at the little red button on my screen. We are. We'll just give about 30 seconds for people to join in and uh, get settled. And we're delighted to have you back with us for the Pandemic of Racism series. This series, being hosted by Senator Kutcher and myself, is focusing on issues related to systemic racism experienced by Indigenous, Black, Asian, and other racialized peoples. The COVID-19 pandemic has made us just that much more aware of both the social and cultural injustice. And we know that the virus has disproportionately affected Indigenous and Black communities and heightened racism against people of Asian descent. The purpose of our series really is to encourage conversations. And from those conversations, we hope to inspire actions, individual actions, but also institutional and systemic actions to create change. So we're trying to create braver spaces for these conversations to happen. We are really, really pleased today to welcome a special guest, Monica Ann Batak. She's a teacher, a community organizer, and a PhD candidate at the School of Social Work at McGill University. She is also a Vanier Scholar, which was awarded in 2018 from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. As a second generation Filipina in the Canadian diaspora, her interdisciplinary research and community practice focuses on improving local, provincial, and national community-based interventions for Filipinos across the life course, including newcomer youth, prospective and current university students, frontline workers in the social services sector, and seniors. She's a mover and a shaker in the social work community as well. And we first met at a national conference in uh, Vancouver a few years ago, and uh, we've been connected ever since. So we're delighted to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Great, and, and and I'll add my voice to Senator Bernard's, and I, I get a chance to start this conversation off with asking a question. Um, and and it, we, we've noted, and it's been reported in the media widely, that instances of violence against Asian people have increased during the time of the pandemic. We've also seen the negative impact of political leadership with the slogan, the Chinese virus, for example. Um, how have has this negative perception uh, affected uh, people of Asian descent in this country? I think it's very difficult when we're having these ongoing conversations about anti-racism to be precise at times. So when I think about our discussions around anti-Asian racism, a lot of it centers on um, you know, who we deem as, as harmful, um, in, especially in the COVID-19 context. So when we think about anti-Asian racism, what's part of the national discourse is often around um, uh, those of us read as Asian, more particularly read as Chinese, and how that, that scare tactic, that um, uh, blame tactic is also now put a across folks who might be identified as Asian. I'm mm -hmm. Filipino, I'm Filipino, close to China, but not necessarily, you know, one in the same. Yet when I walk down the street, when my family members walk down the street, regardless of who they are and where they come from, including Canadian born, we can be seen very quickly as Chinese being told, you know, get out of this country, go back to where you come from, where is your mask? Um, as if we are the, the sole carriers, the instigators of a global pandemic. So I, I think about how the negative discourses that we can hear on the street, 
are also played out in the media. They're also played out by leaders within our institutions, including politicians, and that they have real ramifications, right? Real um, effect on us and our mental health and our well-being and in the ways that we are feeling, you know, protected um, as we walk through, you know, streets here in Canada. Um, I think the the pandemic has shown um, these intersections of, of racist interactions, but the uh, anti-Asian rhetoric is deeply, um, deeply hidden, mm -hmm. but has become more pronounced with COVID-19. I think that if I could pick up on that, um, Monica, I think there's been a, there's a reluctance in this country there's a reluctance in our systems to actually name racism as a hate crime. And I'm wondering if you've seen uh, any of that surface as we're making our way through what I call the dual pandemics. You know, it's it's been hard to stomach um, colleagues or friends, well-meaning friends even say, like, aren't we, aren't we past the conversation about race? Uh, when I see it in the everyday context, politicians alike, public servants alike, I know in their close circles have communicated, um, whether they're Black, whether they're Indigenous, whether they're Asian, that this is an experience well before the pandemic, let alone now. And so the hesitation um, to see you know, our lived experiences, the experiences of our family or our communities is deeply jarring, especially in today's time or asked to reckon about the existence of, of systemic racism, but also how to intervene now in our places of belonging, our places where we have and find employment, um, or where we want to see real change. I think it's deeply disheartening um, to hear, um, you know, the flip side, or perhaps we're not taking, um, we're not, we're using a, a, a uh, Aaron's viewpoint or a lens that you know is more sensitive to race, but I actually argue that it is because of the undermining of racialized experiences that we're at this place of this deep discomfort um, in recognizing challenges I face on a day-to-day -day basis, my family ex experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, and how racialized communities are moving forward with their solidarity amongst each other to make clear that this is the time to really make systemic changes happen. Um, the evidence is there. The evidence has been there provincially, within sectors, uh, within institutions, and yet why are we often immobilized to act? Um, this is the, the, the frustrating position that I find myself in day in and day out. You know, you, you mentioned something that I'd just like to pick up a little bit on. Um, you talked about sort of a, a hidden racism directed at Asian peoples that has become more pronounced during this pandemic, almost like it's become much more visible before this pandemic. I was telling Senator Bernard before we started that one of my uh, researcher educators on my team prior to coming into the Senate, um, a young Asian woman, woman who, who actually showed me in our day-to-day -day activities, walking around the street or going to meetings or, or, or conference or things like that, s such subtle uh, racism, such hidden racism. I hadn't seen that until she pointed it out to me. So somebody who was fairly, fairly well aware of these things, but I didn't see it. Um, and, and it was always there. And then I think this pandemic has just allowed it to flourish or, or certainly brought it into the open. I think what's what's challenging, so the conversation about xenophobia, right? This kind of fear of, of that that is foreign, those who do not belong. I think about how, you know, when we think about who is Canadian, who belongs in the Canadian landscape here in the nation state, who deserves citizenship, in what ways might this be embedded in ourselves that it might mean white? And so for someone who's Canadian born, I've always had Canadian citizenship, right? When I am told time and time again, my English is fantastic, that, oh, it's so great to see you, you know, in a doctoral program that, oh, you're such a, you're a practitioner, right? That this is like a surprise as if, you know, I am not meant to be in these positions that um, Asian communities who have found belonging in the Canadian nation state 
despite of systemic racism over time, still continue to thrive and still in this data age where they're trying to shine a light on our own experiences that um, it is about time that we also pay attention to the historic, the historic uh, examples of deep anti-Asian racism. You wanna talk about the Chinese head tax, you wanna talk about Japanese internment, you wanna talk about you know, the segregation of, of who comes in and under what conditions for citizenship. I mean, these just speak to the way structurally um, Asian communities have often been set apart um, economically, right? Uh, financially, um, socioeconomically, in terms of our access to professions, our access to education. And these are all intertwined and come laid to bear uh, in the time of COVID-19 when regardless of who we are and how we come from, um, other folks can read us as such. And, and that is often that we don't belong, like why are we here? Um, and, and get back to wherever it is that uh, you're supposed to be meant to coming from. But to me, you know, that means just returning back to Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's a bit trivial, but this is, you know, the everyday basis around, you know, folks not knowing that, oh, yeah, there can be Asian folks from f directly from Asia who are here as international students here who have been here three, four, five generations in, um, or just newly arrived just yesterday. Um, and yet we are often lumped together. We are often mm. lumped together and seen as an amorphous Asian group who at this time and age are very, you know, um, they're, they're afraid. They're afraid of what uh, diseases we might carry, um, even though, you know, it's actually quite ill-founded and research and the ongoing, I think media coverage in this is also trying to lay bare um, uh, for us to, unco to uncover our, our stereotypes within this landscape. You've re thank you for making that link between uh, the anti-Asian racism and the xenophobia, and also really highlighting those daily microaggressions that really are racism. And some of them are not so micro, some of them are macroaggressions. You hinted earlier about impact, and I'd like to come back to that and, and sort of invite you to talk a bit about the impact. What's the impact? Because oftentimes people have this stereotype of people from many um, Asian cultures as strong and you know, focused and smart and you know, all of those kind of labels. Um, but what's the impact of this racism? on people that you've seen. And as a social worker, I'm sure, and, and as an educator, I'm sure you've seen many um, examples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I've uh, realized and recognized over the past few years is that, you know, Asian communities often internalize what we would call the, min the model minority myth, right? So mm -hmm. if we just work hard enough, mm -hmm. if we stay silent in the face of racism, in the face of discrimination, um, we might have it better, right? That um, by by um, you know, going on with the status quo, even if that means you know we are discredited at times, that that's okay. Like uh, our sheer will to do better, to do more, to work seven times as harder will be enough. Um, and part of the uh, what we're seeing in the media today, in terms of yes, a a very visceral and tangible increase in anti-Asian racism, you know, violent attacks. Um, you know, this is especially common in just this past week, right, in the, in the U.S. context, but it's happening closer to home. It's happening in Ottawa. It's happening in Toronto. It happens when me and my family go to the grocery store. Um, and these have real ramifications in, a, in an everyday basis around, you know, uh, the self-questioning, whether or not it is up to us or did we do something wrong? But it speaks to a broader, I think, assumption that we can sweep racism under the rug. Um, when I think about how different Asian communities are impacted by um, COVID-19, I'm reminded, so I'm Filipino, and I often hear about the anti-Asian rhetoric or discord, discourse pointed towards East Asians. You know, Filipinos wouldn't necessarily fall under the East Asian category. And then within the broader landscape of Asian communities, there's racism prior to the pandemic faced all across the board. Um, when I think about the Filipino community, many of my family members continue to serve on the front lines, whether that's manufacturing, 
whether that's in healthcare, SPSWs, personal support workers in long-term care homes, as nurses. Um, and they too have this burden of caring for um, other people during this crisis. And yet at the same time, the working conditions um, are not so great, depending on their role. They might not even have recognition um, of the hard work that they're doing. And at the same time, at high risk of bringing this virus also into their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and yet when they're either in the workplace or even um, going to the grocery store, they can encounter racism, just trying to live, just trying to do their job. And this is, I think, the crux of the complicated uh, and embeddedness of racism right now. It's, just, it's across the board. Um, and so I think about the ways that there are particular, particular sub-communities, sub-groups within the Asian community context that have higher, um, higher, higher needs. You know, I, as a, as a scholar, don't have the top needs, but my family members with young children at home um, who cannot work um, their two to three jobs, so they're already taking income losses um, because of this, but yet they are also asked to not, they cannot stay home because they are helping our economy, our day-to-day -day run afloat. And so I think about them um, at this time where the discourse is often about, you know, getting back to normal. Well, normal wasn't so great for a lot of communities of color prior to, um, and it continues not to be so great during the pandemic context as well. You, 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 you mentioned a really interesting concept. They used the word embedded racism. <clears throat> it's so so subtle that the people, as as I was saying before, don't didn't don't see it. And it it, it strikes me that you know there's this, this phrase, which comes probably from the Bible. Um, None are so blind as those that will not see. It doesn't say do not see. It says will not see. And uh, so that implies that there has to be a conscious effort, a willingness to actually look for what you don't see. And uh, what, what are your thoughts? And what, what, as someone who has lived this, who has studied it, who has taught in, in classes, how have you Im embedded the, the willingness to see to people you interact with? Um, I, I have had the great fortune of teaching about anti-Asian racism last semester. Um, and when I was talking to this mixed group of students, right, white and Asian alike, um, they were um, taken aback about how much they did not know, how much uh, their own education, and I know this is a recurrent theme in your discussion series thus far, right, that our, all of our education combined, uh, whether you're at the undergrad level or you've had multiple degrees, how have we actually encountered these very scripts that um, racialized communities are trying to communicate point blank these days? Um, they're astounded that so much can pass. They can go through coursework after coursework, professor after professor, and very few of them actually take to account um, the deep racist histories of many of our um, nation states. Um, and so when I think about that around the, you know, the lack of willingness perhaps to see, I think about how it often takes political will. It takes also deep leadership to make this known despite the um, impulse to negate it, despite the impulse to say, oh, I think we're, we're past that. Um, and that takes great courage. I think about the students who stand up within their school context, their institutional context, yeah. um, to make clear that these histories are important, they're worthy of being learned, whether that's, you know, deep history of black mobilization and social work over how many decades, right? um, the history of helping within our communities, um, Asian communities, Chinese communities, Korean communities, Filipino communities, and the list goes on and on. And so I think about the ways that, um, you know, history and even current issues tend to be communicated through particular lenses. Um, often we call this a, like the dominant lens and often that lens is deeply ableist, deeply um, uh, 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 devoid of race. And in what ways do we have to put on the agenda point blank that racism isn't something to be debated. 
it's not kind of mm. a niche topic of people and their interventions, but it's deeply part of our embedded histories, our histories of growing up in racialized communities or in communities that don't have any um, diversity. And then when ac accounting for it in our day-to-day -day work that we must learn, we must learn how to work through and with difference, that it's actually a strength. It's not something to hope that we all become one in the same because that assumption also assumes that we must uh, pander to or cater to, you know, what, what most anti-racist scholars would be like the white imaginary, that we have to be working more towards being more and more white when mm. quite frankly, we'll never be read as white. So I share that as an extended engagement in terms of, of um, there's historical precedence, right? Of, of these instances, of these encounters, of these, phenomenon happening over and over again. And yet this might be the time that we break open these hard conversations in a way that um, forces action, um, that forces us to not be immobilized in fear, but that we have to move forward so that our institutions are safer for communities like my own. Hmm. And how do, you, how do you move people that don't even know they need to be moved? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's too, that is too close to home, Senator Bernard. <laughs> and, and that may not be a fair question to ask. You know, I'm thinking about, I guess part of me is thinking about allyship and how allyship and, you know, how can we be better, stronger, more authentic allies in pushing forward with the agenda for change? And, and really to get to systemic change so that 20 years from now, you know, our, our grandchildren and great grandchildren are not having the same conversations. I'm reminded of a, I'll, I'll speak to a couple of examples uh, within my practice that hopefully show um, the importance of that solidarity building that's also deeply grounded in respect and trust, but also um, action oriented. So uh, in the McGill context, in the Montreal context, I have some of our, our signs in the background. There's a student-led organizing effort called the Pan-Asian Collective. And these are students who would fall under that broad umbrella, right, of Asian, mm -hmm. um, but they're coming together to make sure that they have a solid base amongst themselves, that they can feel supported. And in that support, they're also trying to educate other communities, um, other friends and family members about things they've never learned in school. Um, they've also instigated a, a Montreal Chinatown uh, campaign to help um, bring, you know, um, material support. So that's financial support to businesses that are affected by COVID-19. And um, their work to me is deeply promising. Uh, they're also working um, to, to build more grassroots supports within other groups as well. And in the Filipino Canadian context, I work with frontline workers in the social services sector. And um, this conversation about how we're doing anti-racism racism efforts is deeply important. Um, if anything, I think we've been trying to prioritize our engagement with anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism. In what ways are we also working and supporting that? And yet at the same time, we experience racism ourselves and our communities are facing it. Yet it's an important lesson in learning that we must work together um, with our other um, counterparts from other racialized communities. But what I really want to emphasize today is that it cannot be on racialized communities alone. Mm -hmm. um, it has to include especially white allies um, or, or allies who have both privilege and power uh, so that the labor isn't held by only folks who are already multiply, multiply um, marginalized. Um, and this, I think, is the most critical part is that cultivation of solidarity and deep trust, that my issues can be seen and understood um, and lifted by other folks as well. So it's not just on my shoulders or community members within within my spaces to hold to hold the line. And this, I think, is the tough part is we've had a lot of conversation and this is not new learning. Um, and yet now that there's a political, a supposed political will, an institutional push to figure stuff out, it doesn't mean rushing. It means returning to the very people who've led many of these initiatives to ask them for direction and support and per 
most likely giving them the support financially in terms of institutional resources to continue work that was happening prior to all of our agendas or radar, right? Uh, picking up that this might be a portfolio uh, commendable um, to 2021. One powerful voice in our communities uh, is the media, not social media, the media itself, the sort of the, the, the traditional media, which frankly is showing signs of fracture uh, in terms of, of, of doubling down on specific uh, perspectives and pushing those perspectives. So we, I want to keep that in mind. But, but. What what kind of role do you see more more traditional media having in 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 really grappling with and addressing this so that the impact of addressing this isn't always oh my gosh we have a horrible problem but but how do we actually get past that sort of sensational story uh, and, and really move that uh, and can the media even have a role in that. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of some of the work, so a book that I'm doing, a book club at McGill this week is uh, Minor Feelings by uh, Kathy Park Hong, an Asian American writer. Um, and in that, she's you know, pointing out to a different, different media discourses about uh, the Asian American or Asian North American experience. I'm um, deeply troubled if the media continues its emphasis on racial trauma and racial trauma alone. Um, that communities of color, Asian communities continue to be um, successful despite all of these odds. We continue to thrive despite uh, systemic racism. And in what ways do we also have other um, counter narratives uh, beyond kind of the racial trauma, the racial aggression, the racial discrimination we experience, but also allows us to be seen fully, um, not just by virtue of uh, the harm enacted um, onto us, but that we are communities thriving and, and seeking belonging um, and are worthy of our stories and our experiences in the main, you know, the main Canadian zeitgeist. Um, mm. So I think about that. I think about how, um, you know, it's important to still shed light on um, this very moment in time in terms of addressing the reality of racism, but it should not always be the focal point in and of itself. Um, when we are also above, right? We are also above uh, trauma. We are also above um, only experiences of discrimination. So I hope I hope that um, mainstream media sees this, but I think alternative media, um, other organizers, other artists are actually paving the way in this regard. To show us that we are we are also um, more than our racial trauma. So that resilience, the strength. And, and that's a conversation we've been having for years now in the in the um, communities of people of African descent. I know we, we don't have much time left, but I wanted to just quickly mention, I know when I've talked about forming the Association of Black Social Workers 41 years ago now, I know you've expressed a, a similar kind of interest. And I'm wondering if you've been able to get any traction with that. We, we have. Um, it is a growing national group um, with its basis in Toronto and in Calgary as well, though we have had a long history of organizing uh, within the social services sector. Uh, but one thing that I want to kind of put full circle here is that before the pandemic, these frontline workers were already telling us that they were experiencing racism on the front lines in their workplaces. And now as we are tasked to also take this to account in our services and our provision, as well as support our communities during this time, um, it's like a um, added uh, stress and burden to make sure that we're accounting for ourselves, taking care of ourselves and our families, let alone within our workspaces and the broader communities at large. So I just appreciate this opportunity to speak frankly about the existence of Asian anti-Asian racism that is deeply intersection, intersecting with a lot of experiences of racism all across the board, uh, but it is due time for Canada as a nation state to really account for these histories and to take action now. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your views, perspectives, and experiences. Absolutely. Uh, building back better means we have a lot of things to focus on. And a lot of things to change. Yeah, absolutely. 
So thanks everyone for tuning in uh, today and we look forward to you joining us next week when we will be talking about um, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thanks again uh, for for, uh, for for helping us with this conversation, Monica. Thank you.